Welcome back, explorers. Brian here, and today we'll finish our study of the themes of geography. As we learned before, geographers ask all kinds of questions about places they intend to study, and these questions tend to be grouped into five themes. We've already looked at the first two, location and character, and this lesson will cover the remaining three, region, movement, and interaction. Together, these themes of geography will give us a fuller picture of places around the Earth. Our learning goals for the day are define formal, functional, and perceptual regions and differentiate between them. Describe how places are interconnected through the movement of people, goods, and ideas, and describe ways in which humans interact with the environment. Ready, explorers? If you were to ask people in Missouri if their state is in the South or the Midwest, you'd get different answers from different people. How can this be? Well, let's take a look. In the far south of the state, you might encounter people whose culture, lifestyle, and speech patterns resemble the culture of southern states. In the northern part of the state, however, you're likely to encounter a rural feel more reminiscent of the Midwest. But the Missouri Tigers play football in the Southeastern Conference against Southern teams like the Alabama Crimson Tide and the Florida Gators, for crying out loud. Obviously, it's a Southern state, right? See how confusing this can be? Let's look at Missouri's history. Missouri was admitted to the Union as a slave state in 1820. That would suggest it's a Southern state. But during the Civil War, Missouri was claimed by both the Union and the Confederacy, and it sent delegates to both of their legislatures. But Missouri is below the Mason-Dixon line, so clearly it's Southern. And yet, Missouri never joined the Confederacy, so maybe it's not. Okay, okay, enough. The simple answer to our question is, it depends. You can try another example. Take a look at these two images in the preview of your PDF and decide where you think they were taken. You might be surprised to learn that both of these images were taken in St. Louis, Missouri during different times of the year. It's not as easy as one might think, right? Why do you think it's such a difficult question? Well, to understand more about how to answer it, we'll have to dive deeper into the theme of region. A region is a group of places with common characteristics. Sometimes there is general agreement about what these traits are. Other times, as is the case with Missouri, a region is defined by people's perceptions, which means their particular viewpoint. To start, there are three types of regions formal, functional, and perceptual. A formal region is an area, usually with clear boundaries, defined by a predominant characteristic. The state of Hawaii, for example, is a formal region. Within the state's borders, all people are subject to the same state laws and are ruled by the same government. Another example is the Great Lakes. They're grouped together because they share geographical features. They're all freshwater lakes in the upper Midwest. They connect the Atlantic Ocean through the St. Lawrence River. The Great Lakes have indisputable geographic boundaries. They're shores. Based on these different examples, we can see that formal regions don't have to be based on anything specific. The common trait could be language, religion, ethnicity, political affiliation, or culture. French-speaking Canada, America's Corn Belt, and San Francisco's Chinatown are all examples of formal regions. A functional region, you guessed it, serves a function. It usually consists of a central place and surrounding areas affected by it. A city and its surrounding suburbs could be a functional region. So can an area that receives reception from a local television or radio station. The places that make up functional regions can even be linked by the flow or movement of some entity. The Amazon drainage basin in South America is a functional region made up of the Amazon River and its tributaries. 
A perceptual region is defined by people's feelings and attitudes. The South and the Midwest, with regard to Missouri, are perceptual regions. Let's get to the bottom of this. Is Missouri in the South? Is it in the Midwest? Maybe. These regions don't have precise borders that are agreed upon by everyone. And because so many different criteria can be used to define a region, the same place might be found in multiple regions. Mexico, for example, is usually recognized as part of the North American continent because of its location. But culturally and linguistically, it shares more in common with the Spanish-speaking nations that make up a perceptual region called Latin America. So is Mexico in North America or Latin America? Our answer here is simply yes, it's in both for different reasons. In any case, understanding why a place is part of a specific region helps us to understand it on a deeper level. What about where you live? What region would you say it's a part of? Maybe you mentioned living near a major city as part of its functional region. The theme of movement presumes that places don't exist all by themselves. They're interconnected. People, goods, and ideas move between them. During the colonial period, Europe, Africa, and the Americas were connected through triangular trade. This triangle was formed by the sailing route taken by European slave traders during that time. On the first leg of the trip, Europeans brought goods and weapons to West Africa in exchange for slaves. On the second leg, traders took enslaved men, women, and children to the Americas and sold them in exchange for raw materials like sugar, cotton, and tobacco. On the final leg, traders brought those resources back to Europe to get paid. This movement of people, goods, and ideas from continent to continent, as troubling as it was, profoundly influenced the history, culture, and economy in all three continents. Analyzing how the movement of people, goods, and ideas migrate from place to place is another way to understand them on a deeper level, and we'll keep a close eye on that throughout the course. Let's try where you live as an example. What patterns of movement can you identify in your town? Maybe you said that it's hard to get things via same-day shipping because you live far away from the nearest warehouse. The last theme of geography is interaction. This has to do with how people respond to their environment, by changing their behavior and reaction to it, or by changing the environment itself and the consequences for doing so. Humans have made all kinds of changes to their environment. Big, small, intentional, accidental, positive, and negative. A small way that you interact with your environment might be that you put on a coat when it's cold outside. What about a bigger example? The American Southwest is a hot, dry desert that's not particularly easy or inviting to live in. But that was before people invented air conditioning, irrigation, cars, and swimming pools. Now the Southwest is one of the fastest growing economies and population centers in the country. But fast growth brings challenges. How do we feed everyone? Where will the water they need come from? What will the consequences be for introducing new plants and animals into the ecosystem, and how will we respond to them? These are the questions that geographers ask when they study interaction. So let's try it from your perspective. How do people interact with the environment where you live? Maybe you said it's hot during the summer and people wear shorts and flip-flops when they go to the beach. If that's the case, I invite you to think about the consequences of those behaviors on the plants and animals that live close to the ocean. As we continue our study of geography, we'll use the themes of geography to ask questions about the places we visit around the world. Our understanding of the world and our place in it will be fundamental to our goals of knowing the Earth, loving it, and caring for it. Until next time, keep exploring! Hey.